Good morning, Representative. Good morning. Nice to see you. Welcome Thank to you. Iowa. Thank you Good for morning. the invitation. Good to see you, Good to see you Governor. Congresswoman, of the 20 industries that are forecast to lose jobs at the fastest pace over the next decade, 19 of them are in the manufacturing industry. The 20th is the federal government, believe it or not. Uh, how, do you, how do you address this trend? Well, what we need to do to address this trend is to get our economy and to get the manufacturing business sector in one that would actually work. And I think that this is something that the National Association of Manufacturers has already identified. They've said this is the lifeline that we need. In other words, we need the federal government to get off our back when it comes to taxes. You're taxing us to death. You're making us uncompetitive because United States manufacturing is 20 percent more difficult, less competitive, you might say, than their nine leading competitors around the world. Next, the regulatory burden is out of control. Steve Jobs recently said this to President Obama. He said, you're killing us with regulations. It's true. Tort reform is a, is a must do. It costs our GDP, 2% of GDP, just to deal with tort reform and lawsuit abuse. I'm a former federal tax lawyer. I see the lawsuit ab abuse all around me. And again, something else that's really hurt manufacturing is the lack of affordable, accessible energy. So we need to have an all of the, uh, the above energy strategy so we can have tremendous resources here in our own backyard. All the economists will point to aggregate demand, that economic term. In, in other words, consumer demand for products. That has been uh, the stagnant part of this economy, and that has hurt the job growth. It has hurt manufacturing. It's hurt many industries. How do those policies wind up addressing consumer demand? Well, they help consumer demand because just like the manufacturers are having to hold back on their products, it's because it begins with the consumer. The consumer looks around and sees that the economy is in trouble, and so they're unwilling to buy products. Now, the good news is in the third quarter of this year, we saw 2.5% growth. The first quarter was 0.4%. The second quarter was about one3 But still, 25 is fairly anemic. With the kind of recession that we had, we should have been seeing 5% growth. So this is something we can see and it, the United States has about 5% of the consumers for manufacturing. 95% of the consumers are outside of the United States. So we want to make sure that American manufacturers have access to their markets. What would you like to do in your first 100 days in the Oval Office when it comes to international trade? Oh, easy. What I, what I want to do is change and reform the tax code. Again, I'm a, I'm a private businesswoman. My husband and I start our own profitable company. We think profit's a good thing. And also, as a tax lawyer, number one, we have to reform the tax code. I want to have a flatter, fair, more simple tax code. And we, we have a proven model with Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. And so mine borrows from those principles. But then also, I will repeal Obamacare. I am committed to that. I introduced the bill in Congress, and I've been fighting for this. And also Dodd-Frank. I wrote that bill as well to repeal Dodd-Frank. We've got to have a moratorium on any further regula regulatory burden. How do those domestic policies, though, increase international opportunities for manufacturers like Vermeer? Well, excellent question. The reason, the, the way that it does is that it, it creates certainty for manufacturers. Right now, manufacturers look at the Dodd-Frank bill, the Jobs and Housing Destruction Act, and they look <laughs> at Obamacare, and both of those bills together say, hey, that's a lot of costs for me. Those are a lot of unwritten rules, and these are two bills that will never finish being written. So it is the mother of all nightmare on regulatory burden. That's cost. That's all it is. Government is a cost of doing business. Dodd-Frank is a terribly high cost, as is Obamacare. But at the same time, the bright spot in the economy in the third quarter has been exports. Despite right. Dodd-Frank, despite Obamacare, as you say, we have seen exports continue to increase. We have, and that's what we want to continue. Part of that is because we finally passed the three free trade agreements. I traveled to Colombia, I met with President Santos, and he said essentially to me, what's wrong with people in Congress? Don't they see how this will benefit manufacturing? Don't they see how this will benefit ag? Well, of course, we need market share because 95% of the consumers are outside of the United States. We have to grow our share, not inhibit it. And so that's why I was pleased to vote for those three free trade agreements. But we have a dozen others that are out uh, currently being negotiated, both free trade and fair trade. We have to remember both aspects, but the United States is only involved in one, so we can step up our game too. Talking about competing in the world marketplace, when I was governor before, we were able to attract six automotive component parts companies from Canada to Iowa. We got Ipsco Steel, locate here, Skyjack and many other Canadian companies. 
About two months ago, I was in Illinois where they're raising taxes, encouraging companies to move to Iowa, and one of these companies said, you know, we like what you have to say and what you're doing about reducing the tax and regulatory burden in Iowa, but we're concerned about the federal tax burden. Yeah. When I was governor before, the Canadian dollar is worth 65, 70 cents. Now it's par with the American right. dollar. Right. Their financial institutions are stronger, and they've reduced their taxes. Their federal That's corporate right. taxes are lower than ours, right. and they're going to go from 18% to 15%. What do you think we need to do to compete with Canada and other countries so that we don't have American companies moving their operations north of the border? Well, you just explained why you got reelected governor. There's no, <laughs> that's exactly why you did. And, and we need to do the same things. I had met with a muffler manufacturer down in Des Moines, and he has a plant in Des Moines, and he has one in Canada. And he said, look, I had a decision to make. I saw all the out-of-control spending, the debt accumulation. I don't see the corporate tax rate going down. We're the second highest corporate tax rate in the world. He said Canada had an 18% corporate tax rate in 2010. I purchased a million-dollar piece of equipment. I could either put it up in my... Canada plant or in my Iowa plant. He said, I sent it to Canada. When I sent that piece of equipment, I sent jobs with it too. I hated to do it, but it's because of corporate tax rate. That's why I want to make the United States one of the most competitive corporate tax rates in the world. And essentially, my plan is to make the United States the best place to do business for manufacturing. I have I, Our family, um, I, I was born and raised in Iowa, and my dad's job was in manufacturing. He worked for the Chamberlain Corporation in Waterloo, Iowa, and they are, they are no more. And unfortunately, too many manufacturers have left Iowa and the United States for better climates to do business. That has to change. Do you support cutting or eliminating a tax on repatriated profits that American oh, companies I, bring back? I support zeroing out uh, the, the repatriation. If we would zero that out, because profits are stimulus. That's the true stimulus, our profits. So we want to bring that $1.2 trillion from overseas here to the United States. And would companies be able to use that money for any purpose they see fit? Without a doubt, it's their money. Including they stock should. buybacks and dividends? Anything they want to spend, use it for. And, you know, you grew up in Iowa and you've represented Minnesota in the Congress. Both of these states are states that have really done a lot in renewable energy. And mm -hmm. I want to ask you also, do you support maintaining the, uh, the renewable energy standard, which is present federal law, and also extending the wind tax credit, which is your state and my state as well as Texas have been leaders in in wind generation? Well, they have been because the United States is replete with, with the greatest energy assets that we have in the world. We're in a wind tunnel, if you will, <laughs> right here, going, going all the way down to Texas and through Oklahoma. What I believe in is an all of the above energy approach. I want to expand and explode all of American energy production. There was a Congressional Research Service report that came out this year that said America is the number one energy resource rich nation in the world. What I would like to do is a reexamination of those credits because quite frankly, I'd like to pull them back and let these, these industries be able to be more self-supporting and stand on their own. But I, what I want to do is pull back the regulatory burden. There is a, an astounding $1.8 trillion regulatory burden every year that businesses comply with. When you consider that we send into the federal government $2.2 trillion in, in tax receipts this year, and on top of that, we also pay a $1.8 trillion uh, uh, regulation burden, that's what we need to change. I want to pull the regulatory burden back, and then I don't think that we'll need the level of subsidies that we have in the past. Does that include ethanol? That includes all, all energy, because I, I really want to see a, a federal playing field. We've seen what a disaster it is when the federal government picks winners and losers, like Solyndra, for example, that's in the news right now. And I'd prefer that the United States not make those choices. I fully believe all of these industries have it within their capacity to stand on their own. You are talking about tax policy and, and tax ideas earlier. We have a, a question from the audience from Kendig Neen on taxes as well. Hi, Kendig Neen from Al John Manufacturing in Tumwa, Iowa. Uh, manufacturing has benefited over the years from several items in the current tax code that promotes domestic manufactured goods for export. And as president, I'd like to know specifically what your administration would do in tax reform that would continue to make this promotion and uh, our exports pos possible. 
Well, we're looking at the expiration and December 31st of the R&D credit. This has served business very well, and I would call on President Obama to continue the R&D credit. Again, what I want to do is simplify the code in every possible way, but there's a few things that do help manufacturers. One would be the Section 179, the, if we have 100% expensing on Section 179, and what that is is essentially when a manufacturer purchases a capital product for their business, they should be able to write it off 100% in the year of purchase rather than having to um, drag that out over 15, sometimes over 30 years. That's very helpful. The R&D credit is very helpful. But over time, I'm looking at a serious flattening of the corporate tax rate. 34% is completely unacceptable. And you can close a certain amount of, quote, loopholes that benefit just one industry over another if you flatten that rate. But in the meantime, I think we do need to extend R&D and I support 100% expense expensing of, of purchase capital products. Congressman, this brings up the point, what role do you think a federal policymaker like a president should play in regards to supporting research and development and American innovation? Well, again, I think that the, the best thing that President Obama could do right now would be to, to make a speech or issue a statement and say he will make that permanent going forward. That's the biggest problem. As I'm a businesswoman. That's the biggest problem business has right now. They have no idea what's going to come out of Washington, D.C. when they wake up in the morning. And that's why we need to have an immediate moratorium on regulations. It's killing us. And we also need the president to make some statements that he's going to bring some certainty back into the regulatory world and for taxes, that there won't be new taxes. You've indicated you support repeal of Obamacare and also tort reform, both good things, I think, for um, the health industry. Uh, what would you do on the positive side to try to get people to take more ownership of their own health and to reduce health care costs? Because increasing health care costs is a tremendous drag on manufacturing and it actually hurts all of consumers in this country. There's no question. I was at Carver Pump uh, earlier this week, and that's what they told me. They've, they've actually increased their efficiency dramatically without hiring new employees, but they've also expanded their product line. They've been able to do that through efficiency, but their biggest burden is health care. And so what I would do today, each state has a monopoly of, of insurance companies in their own state. I would get rid of that and let every American purchase any health insurance policy they want anywhere in the United States with no minimum federal mandates. Then I would allow people to pr pay for their own health insurance with their own tax-free money. They could pay for their insurance premium, their copay, their deductible, their pharmaceutical, their medical devices, whatever it is, to whatever level they need because people have different medical needs. And then I would have uh, total tort reform. That's what we need to have, true tort reform, because that addressed the biggest problem in healthcare today, which is costs. The other thing that we don't hear much about is the fact that this country is scaring venture capitalists in healthcare out of the country. So whether it's drug manufacturers or medical device manufacturers, we're losing cures right now. And so we want to have more innovation, more productivity. That's manufacturing. We've got a lot of healthcare manufacturing, but we're scaring it out of the country with our unreasonable uh, debt burden, our, our regulatory burden, and also our tax code. Let me ask you about health care, though. You're calling for an individual market, then, to develop, a robust yes, individual sir. market. Yes. But we have seen this health market that's developed today that manufacturers and companies in all industries are dealing with, that size matters. If they can buy in bulk, they'll get better discounts for the company a portion of the insurance as well as for the employee portion. How do you ensure that the cost structure of an individual market doesn't run out of control? Well, associated health plans. They work very well, and that's something that people can easily join. Again, the federal government hasn't been helping to, to reduce costs on business. They've only gone the opposite way. They've heaped burdens on business. And so my approach as President of the United States would be to work with business and make their life easier. I want manufacturing to succeed wildly. That's my goal. I don't want to see manufacturing be the servant to government. I think government needs to serve the people, and manufacturing is a backbone of our economy. Finally, I want to ask you about uh, productivity. You mentioned Carver Pump in Muscatine, Iowa, that you visited earlier. Uh, the, uh, the manufacturing industry employs 2 million fewer people today than it did mm -hmm. just four years ago, but yet the U.S. economy is actually larger today than pre-Great Recession. Right. Is the market and is the manufacturing industry going to have to deal 
with a more productive workforce, which will mean fewer jobs in the future. Well, they are already, but again, I believe that we can have more manufacturing return to the United States and grow in the United States. I talked to a manufacturer last week who said to me, he's about the last tool and die maker in his area. My father was a tool and die maker. That's how he started out, and then he became an engineer. We need, this is something else we need, are more engineers in the United States. Steve Jobs just said recently, uh, prior to his death to President Obama, that there are 700,000 that they're employing outside of the country for Apple. And part of that is because they can't find 30,000 engineers in the United States. That's a real problem. Our, our education system, which is why I got involved in politics, we raised 23 foster children in our home, we have to encourage more science and math in the United States. We need more engineers and innovators. Young people want to be, they want to be entrepreneurs, and so we need to encourage that. Congressman Bachman, thank you for your time thank and your you. comments. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Governor. You very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.